Good evening all, and welcome. Tonight, we have an extremely special guest. I am proud to announce that tonight's video will feature one of my favourite creators, Killer Orange Cat. So give him a huge welcome in the comments section. I've collaborated and narrated some awesome stories for his channel as well. So when you're done here, be 100% sure to go over to his channel and listen to the exclusive stories that you'll hear from me that you'll only find on his channel. Really, some of the best. I know you'll profoundly enjoy them. I'll leave those links at the end of the video and in the description in case you want to check it out earlier. But without further ado, it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. Every year for summer holidays, me and my family go to my grandparents' house in a region in France called Bretagne, and they have the luck to live on a cliff right next to the beach, which is pretty neat. And for you to understand the situation I was in, I'll do a quick description of the place, and most importantly, how to access the beach. When we get out of the house, we need to cross a little road to get to an entrance, between bushes. Then it's a clear but narrow path that you can take to just enjoy the view of the sea, or you can also go to a staircase built in the rock of the cliff. Then, you'll just have to walk on medium-sized stones, and ta-da, you've arrived to the beach. The place itself is pretty big but there's only a few ways to access it. By the staircase I described, or by another one at the other end of it. Also, the big thing to mention, as I grew older, I stopped building sandcastles and swimming with my family. I'm 18, and the older of three siblings that are way younger than me. So I was done playing childish games and I had started to climb on the cliffs for fun. Not the steep ones, it was more or less the semi-hiking of partially collapsed cliffs. This will be relevant later. Last year, after having dinner, I headed out for a little walk on the beach. No one seemed interested in coming with me. So I went alone. No big deal, I did it every evening. After going down the staircase, I walk a little bit, and then sat down on a stone to smoke a joint and listen to some music. Not really smart, but hey, I'm a teen in a little village that I go to every summer, and as much as I love my family, it gets pretty boring from time to time. I'm enjoying my me time, when I spot a guy from the corner of my eye, about 40 meters away from me. No big deal. It's a free access beach after all, but then he starts heading towards me. His head was shaved, and he had square-shaped glasses on, maybe around mid-twenties to early thirties. He was pretty tan, like he worked outside, and the bald dude continued getting closer. I mean, I can't say anything, I don't own the beach. As he's approaching me, I hear over my music that he's trying to speak to me. I removed my headphones, and he said something along the lines of, Hey, you look familiar. Have we met before? Um, no. He kept insisting that he saw me at the beach today. And sure, I said, Yeah, well, maybe, but there are tons of people at the beach. I don't remember seeing everyone I saw. The way I responded clearly implies that I'm not interested in having this conversation with him. But he sits right next to me, and he keeps talking, mostly about himself, and that he loves the beach, that the weather is nice, and that I'm nice with him. Here's when things got creepy. He says that it's rare to find nice girls, and that he's happy I'm not like the other girls. He then asks me about my name, where I live, and of course I don't say anything. He starts to lean in closer, which made me feel very uncomfortable, with a huge grin on his face. That's when it hit me. Remember when I said that there was only a few entrances to the beach? 
That guy was sitting right between me and the staircase. I was cornered, no one was there, and we were completely alone. And even though I'm quite athletic, I'm four foot nine and weigh 90 pounds, this guy is twice my size, and he clearly wants to continue our discussion. As I'm not responding, he starts to sound annoyed, clenching his fists, but still with that stupid grin glued to his face. He asked me if I really was a good girl, and why don't I talk to him? I'm bricking it at this point. I look to my left, and almost let out a sigh of relief. One of the cliffs I'm used to climbing is right next to us, and I know I could rush up in a matter of seconds, and I used to do it running. Run on a narrow path and get straight home. So I got up and said, I don't want to talk to you anymore. Good evening. He looked startled for a moment, looking back to me in the staircase, which confirmed my suspicions. He thought he had blocked my only way of escape, since the other stairs were far away. To this day, it still scares me that it was his first reaction. At this point, I'm high, tired, and terrified, but I start to walk confidently to the cliff at my high pace, and in the corner of my eye, I can see that he is standing, looking in my direction. As soon as I'm close enough, I literally start to jump from rock to rock as fast as I can, scratching myself in the process. When I scramble to the top, I look down and he's looking at me, not smiling like before, but frowning, a look which tells me he's on the verge of committing a crime. I then sprinted to my grandparents' house, which lucky is really close, and explained everything to my mother the next day. I reported the guy to the police station, giving the best description that I could, since it is a small village, and they could apprehend him easily if he was a resident. So yeah, I made it out. What did this guy actually have planned? I'm glad I didn't have to stick around to discover what it was. This is my first post on here, so I apologize if it's too long or the format is incorrect. This happened very recently, only about four days ago, while I was camping with my best friend. We were both seniors in high school, and we were on a road trip for spring break. We live in Oregon, and drove down the coast of Northern California. And we had a late start to leaving our houses, and arrived at a little beach south of the Redwoods. Just after 9pm, it was pouring rain and dark out, so we parked on a dirt road that had access to the beach and decided against walking down the sand to set up the camp. My friend drives an old Toyota pickup with a camper shell covering the bed, which has a mattress in the back, so we decided to just sleep there. This beach area where we were was very secluded and belonged to a local Native American tribe that did not mind visitors using the site as long as they were respectful. After talking for a while in the shelter of the truck canopy, my friend fell asleep. Before drifting off myself, I realized I had forgotten to lock the passenger door of the truck. All of our valuables were stored in the cab, so I hoped nobody would come along to rob us in our sleep. After a dreamless few hours of sleep, I heard the sound of the driver's side door handle of my friend's truck being lifted. That door happened to be locked, but I was awake at that point, and terrified that whoever had tried to open the door would now go around to the unlocked side would try to get into the bed, where they likely had no idea we were sleeping. It was still dark out at this time, but I heard footsteps start to walk around to the back of the truck. I grabbed my flashlight and shone it through the back window of the camper shell, in hopes of alerting the intruder that there were people in the vehicle. I heard the footsteps get a little farther away, and then I heard the sound of sticks snapping, and something heavy being thrown. Then, the man let out a long guttural yell. A few moments passed, and more things were thrown, and more general yells mixed in with the occasional FUCK at the top of his lungs. It didn't take more than two or three yells before I woke up my friend. Dude, there's a crazy man outside. He's trying to get into the truck, and now he's walking around yelling. I blurted it out as I shook his shoulder. My friend sat upright and was trying to peer out the window it was still pitch black out. I checked my phone and it was 5 a.m. 
The sounds of the man walking around in the woods near the truck did not let up. Neither did his frequent yells of fuck and the sounds of him throwing and smashing what I could only guess were logs or large rocks. Occasionally, we would hear his yells from farther away and we thought he was leaving, only to have him return to yelling right by the truck. Only moments later, we sat huddled in fear for a good hour, unsure of what to do. His shouts sounded as though he was full of rage, but he never attempted to get into the truck again. Eventually, the owners of the only other car, parked on the dirt road, came to their vehicle and drove off as the sky started to lighten. And we did not hear anything, any more yelling or log throwing after that, and eventually we were both able to fall asleep again for a few more hours. Waking up around 10 a.m., it was hard to believe that terrifying hour at the crack of dawn that had happened, but we both remember it too vividly to dispute. We still have no idea what the man was doing nor why he sounded so angry. But to the guy screaming profanities in the dark by our truck, let's not meet. About the time I was 17 or so, a few friends and I were out at the beach making dry ice bombs in the middle of the night. This was probably around midnight or so as we were quite delinquent back then. There were about five or six of us, and we were just chilling, having a good time, trying to make potholes in the ground with dry ice bombs in the sand. It was quite a foggy night, which isn't too unusual considering I live in Oregon, on the northwest coast. And it rains here 300 days out of the year. After 30 minutes or so of being rambunctious teenagers, we decided to walk down the beach a bit. After about 15 minutes of walking, we hear a strange scratching grinding sound and stop and listen. Sooner than 20 seconds later, a tall figure emerges out of the fog adjacent to the ocean but between us and the ocean. This guy had to be at least 8 foot tall, and it was dragging a chain. Not your average chain, but a massive chain that looked like it had been used for an anchor or something. The rings were probably at least 8 to 12 inches a piece, and it looked like they had to be at least an inch in diameter too. Now this chain wasn't short by any means. It was probably 40 to 50 feet long, and this dude was just dragging it in the sand behind him in the middle of the night. We all sat there silently, and I got the biggest shiver down my spine, and all my hair stood up on end, and my breath seemed to escape me. We gathered watching the figure cross our path, and make its way up the beach, and the chains slowly faded out of sight. Well that was creepy as hell, I thought. We then continued back down the beach to a shipwreck called the Peter Iredale, which is all about but eroded now, and took to the cool sea spray to enjoy the ominous swishing of the serene ocean waves. We toss a few dry ice bonds into the water and head back to our car, where we parked probably half a mile up the shore. As we're walking, we hear the noise again. My heart thumps, and I get cold sweats. It was that thing, trudging the goddamn chain up the beach. It had to have been the exact same place where we saw it the first time. There were no drag marks in front of him, no footsteps, no indication that anyone had laid foot on the ground in front of him in the path that had previously been walked. The sand was dry. It wasn't washed over by waves or anything of the sort. We watched it for a moment out of curiosity as to what the actual hell was going on. We stood there dumbfounded, watching the figure trudge through the sand with this unfathomably massive chain dragging behind it. It stopped dragging the Satan chain, and stared directly at us, piercing our soul and the essence of our being. We just stood there jaw dropped, staring back at this shadowy figure. It begins to slowly march towards us, and we booked it through the sand. I've never run so fast in my life. We all pile into the car, 
Bro turns the engine on and we floor it out of there, easily hitting 80 miles an hour on the straight stretch of access road. We absolutely hauled serious ass out there. The entire time, I was staring out the back window of the car, for some reason expecting it to terminate her after us and catch up. Thankfully it didn't, and I never saw the shadowy figure again. It was the strangest, most heart-wrenching, terrifying thing I've ever seen. Neither of us were on any kind of drugs. We were all straight-edge kids, clean as a whistle, and shadow figures and chains scaring kids? Shame on them. A week or so later, a friend of ours who wasn't there that night told me that people used to practice black magic in the dunes there, and that there were artifacts of demonology and inverted crosses scattered about. I said his accusations were nonsense. Turns out it was all true. I went to the mum and asked her about it, and she said she had heard similar stories. So naturally, we looked into it a bit, and then went out to search for said black magic devil-worshipping sites. We were able to find some sort of inverted crosses, which were made of some sort of metal that was all but rusted over, and concrete blocks, probably a cubic metre in size in a few different places. Holes bored through them, and metal rings inserted through them, as if to be an anchor point. I put two and two together, and theorised that the chain was the one point connecting to these blocks in the dunes. For Lord knows what purpose, I assumed that that creature was a black magic slash demonic summon, and I will never set foot on those cursed dunes again. Also, it turns out this is in the Oregon Ghost Stories book, which is chilling to have witnessed firsthand. It's certainly spooky stuff. I found a dead guy on the beach, and possibly met his murderer. This is a story that happened to me when I was a child. I thought I'd share it on here. I never shared this with anyone before. So here we go. This took place back around 2008, if my memory serves me right. Me and my family had just moved to Costa Rica, and we enjoyed spending most of our time at the beach. And one beach in particular, which was near a lovely little river I liked to swim in. It was on the same beach that nine-year-old me found a dead body floating in the ocean. To give a little context, i have been playing on the beach, which we thought was a relatively safe beach, so my parents were farther up. <laughs> How wrong we were about it being safe. I remember seeing something floating in the water, but I wasn't sure what it was. So I went to investigate and found a dead man just floating there. Part of his leg had been hacked off. It was obviously he had not drowned. The man had clearly been murdered. Around this time, we had heard about a recent string of murders that had happened both on the Caribbean side, Costa Rica, where we were, and on the Pacific side. The murders had been happening every six months, rotating in between both regions of the country. So there was a reason to assume this murder had been done by the same person, since it seemed to fit the timeline. As far as I can remember, the details of the murder were never disclosed in any of the local newspapers, only that the man had been a tourist from England, so there was no way for anyone who had not seen the man on the beach to know the specifics of the murder. Eventually, the whole thing blew over, and we returned to that same beach. And I can't quite remember a time frame, but it was definitely within a few months of me finding the dead man that this next part happened. One day I was swimming in the river with my mother, and a very strange man popped up out of the water, startling us. He had a spear gun in his hand and a snorkel mask on. Anyway, he began talking to my mom, and I think we could both tell that something was just off about this guy. I wasn't really paying attention for most of their conversation, but I do remember him bringing up the recent murder on the beach, and he seemed to know a great lot of details about it which, as I previously mentioned, were not available to the public. It almost seemed as if he was trying to confess that he was the one who murdered the man, but without directly saying so. He also talked about how he traveled in between the Caribbean and the Pacific side of Costa Rica. 
spending half a year in each spot. Eventually, they also got on the topic of what he did for a living, and he went into a great detail about how he made the masks for the movie Eyes Wide Shut, and that he would make those masks, and I presume other ones based on real-life human emotions, and that he specifically liked capturing the look of fear. We were totally taken back by this guy, and really didn't know what to do. Eventually, he just got back into the water and swam away, and thankfully we never saw him again. I do not know if this is related or not, but the weird strain of murders suddenly stopped after that. Well, sorry for the long post. I tried to find the article about the man who was murdered, so I could link it, but couldn't seem to find info on it. When I was seven or eight, my family went to the beach and rented a hotel room. We had the kind of rooms that you rent out both and they connect through a door. There's one door to leave the room, and there is the door in between that connects the rooms individually. In the room connecting to ours, there was an army family, military father, some kids and a wife. My older sister was supposed to be watching me, as we were down at the jacuzzi during the evening. As we're just playing and hanging out and having a good time. I didn't get out much, was naive, and a little kid, and to give a little description, we're both white-skinned, blue-eyed blondes. Then, this person sits in the jacuzzi with us. She starts conversing with us, and is just making herself very comfortable. I was very naive as a kid, and eventually, we started talking books, and she's talking about her kids, who we haven't seen yet. We are having a really good conversation. I felt like it was very in-depth, and my sister decides she wants to go back to the room. But I don't. I wanted to stay and talk with this lady. So my sister goes back to the room, and now it's just seven-year-old me and some forty-year-old woman. It should have set off some creepy alarm bells, but it did not. She just starts talking about going and walking on the beach. It's about 10pm and she wants to go on the walk, and get shells. I thought it was a great idea. I'd get to walk on the beach at night. I felt so free, and like a big kid. I didn't need my sister or anything. So I run back to the room to tell my grandparents that I'm walking on the beach with Sue, or whatever her name was. I remember my grandmother reading her book, barely listening to what I said, and she just shook me off. It's important to know, I didn't live with my parents. So I start walking down the corridor, that was really dark and dim, as it was quite cheap. I'm going through the stairwell, like something out of a movie. Too bad I'd never seen this movie. As I'm walking through it, the woman is at the bottom telling me to hurry up. While walking through the stairs, Army Dad comes running down, and asks where I'm going. He told me, your mum is calling you, it's really important, we gotta go and basically grabbed me by the wrist, softly, and led me back to our room. He knocked on our door and explained what had happened. I never thought much about it until a year ago, when it came back to me. This woman was leading me away to the beach alone at night, and this army guy got a terrible feeling in his gut, so he intervened. When he said my mum was looking for me, and I don't live with my mum, it set off some alarm bells in my head. That's when I realised something was up, so I didn't resist going back to my family. As a kid, I knew since he was saying my mum wanted me, it was important. I just knew something was up, because I don't live with her. I'm now 20 years old, and I truly believe that this woman was trying to lure me away to do god knows what, and this army dude had a bad feeling and saved my life. Thinking back, I get such a bad feeling all throughout my body. I now know that I wouldn't have made it back from that beach trip. Thank you, army dude. Your gut feeling and having a watchful eye saved something terrible from happening to me. That woman was creepy. We never even saw her kids. Okay, so this happened in Maine when I was about three years old, almost four. I was at the beach with my mom. We went as a group with some other stay-at-home moms and their kids. It was a fairly hot 
crowded day there, and I found myself playing with the other kids at the edge of the water. And for some reason I strayed away a bit, and that's when a middle-aged woman started talking to me. I remember her very clearly. She looked like a mother would, with one-piece black bathing suit, cargo shorts, sunglasses, and her hair pulled up in a bun. She asked me what games I liked to play, and what my favorite candy was. As soon as I told her, I believe I said Tootsie Pops, she told me she had some in her car, and persuaded me to come with her. And yes, I know, I was quite the naive child. She was cheerful and enthusiastic, taking my hand and leading me through the crowded beach. And I skipped alongside her, and had no fear whatsoever. Then my lucky star, my mom spotted me from a distance and started screaming my name at the top of her lungs and jumping up and down while, while waving her arms. The woman immediately let go of my hand and darted away. I just stood there, terribly confused until my mom got to me. I get chills thinking about it now. She seemed so nice at the time, though I admit I was way too trusting. It stinks of an attempted kidnapping now. If my mom hadn't spotted me, who knows where I would be, or if I would even be alive. This happened about seven years ago. I was staying at my friend Diana's house. She lives pretty close to a small beach, which is really more of a vague shoreline, but it's still nice. We both enjoy going on adventures, so one night we decided to go for a walk and ended up walking along the shore. Her dog Penny was with us, occasionally running out into the water, doing cute dog things. I'm not a huge dog person, so I'm not sure what kind of dog she was, but she was a medium-sized dog. Not big, but way too big to be called small. We were only there for ten minutes, before we heard a twig snap from the forest at the edge of the shore. Both of us froze listening to see if we could hear anything. We thought we heard someone shushing someone else. But we brushed it off as being paranoid, and remained on high alert. The tide was coming in, and there was only one way back to safety, a single path which we had come down on. Everywhere else was essentially a cliff, covered in thorns and whatnot. Not fun to climb. We started making our way back to the path, taking our shoes off since we realised we waited too long and wouldn't make it before the water reached us. As we were walking, we heard more twigs snapping in the forest and hushed voices. We looked at each other and paused. Diana asked me what we should do, and I really didn't know. Everyone at her home was asleep, so we couldn't call them, and we didn't want to call the police if it wasn't a dangerous situation. I ended up telling her we had no choice. We had to make it to the path before the tide came in. We start again, picking up the pace a little, coaxing Penny along with us. It's at this moment that we heard a growl and a low bark, followed quickly with more shushing sounds. I could hear the voices, though I don't remember what I heard them say. There were two men, and they had a dog. There are no houses this close to the shore. Diana's house is the closest, and it's a good five minute walk away. The forest that surrounds the shore is pretty thick, and it's not good for camping in. There's no viable reason for someone to just be hanging out there. We both registered this and start to run. I heard one of the men yell, Go get him! And heard the dog's collar jingle as it started to run. Penny was right behind us, so when we saw the silhouette of a dog in front of us, we knew it wasn't her. The dog started growling, and Penny was bouncing around playfully behind us, clearly not sensing this dog's aggression, as she was a very young dog. We stood still, unaware of what to do. The sound of twigs breaking was getting closer, and Diana carefully knelt down to get a rock and tossed it towards the forest, to which the dog and Penny went chasing after it. Diana was worried about Penny, but we both kept running, and hardly stopped for a breath. When we made it to the path, before the tide I might add, we could see flashlight beams in the forest, 
and heard the men cursing and clumsily maneuvering their way through the branches. We called for Penny as silently as we could, but she never came. We ended up having to leave without her as the men were getting too close. We ran back to her house and locked the door, and haven't talked about what happened since. Penny showed up the next morning perfectly fine, in case anyone was wondering. I've had a few strange encounters with sketchy people, but this one was the only time I ever felt truly in danger. We had just entered Fifth Fleet and taken responsibility as the main carrier. When we got word that pirates were trying to capture an American boat, I forgot what kind, it happens a lot, in the Indian Ocean, our captain got on the mic and said, there's some bad people trying to do some bad things to some good Americans, and we're going to go get them. We sped down there, almost leaving our escort behind, and then they called for the Snoopy team. I was the Snoopy team guy. The Snoopy team runs to the top of the island and reports what they see, whether it's a plane, MV, or anything, really. We saw them, and apparently the American boat escaped. They were in some crappy vessel when we got so close to them that we lost sight of them from up top. We were probably only like 30 yards away when we saw a guy go on their deck and point a rocket launcher at us. I don't know why, but me and the other dude I was with was bringing it bitch wave in our hands and shit. The camera guy even took a picture, but the rocket launcher dude must have thought better of it and went back inside. We stayed watching them for a bit, and then the Indians came and asked if we planned to engage. We said no, and they asked us to step back. Then they proceeded to fuck up the crappy ship. After they secured Snoopy team, I went back and was looking at the pictures, and my buddy was like, dude, you could have died by rocket launcher. I laughed. Man, that could have went badly. LOL. This happened a couple of summers ago, when I was in the seventh grade. Me and a few friends were just hanging out at Long Beach, in Gloucester, just playing with an aluminium bat and tennis balls. We got bored of just playing normal wiffle bat, so we decided to go do a home run derby. We decide to do it near the big stone wall that separates the beach houses and the beach. We said that if the ball goes over the wall, it's a home run. This works out fine for a bit, but we had to keep running up the stairs to get the ball out of people's lawns. I went up and got yelled at by some guy, so we looked for somewhere else to play. There's a large motor inn at the end of the beach that has many balconies, so we played there. Now, this is where things start to take a turn for the worst. We were hitting the ball towards the motor inn. We did this for a solid 20 minutes, until, of course, I hit the old man reading on his balcony. He yells and says he's going to get the manager. Us, being stupid, wait there and then the manager comes and tells us that we can't play there. Here's where the beach creep comes in. This man, who's probably in his late forties in a polo and scally cap, walks over to us and tells us that the manager is an ass. We agreed, just assuming he's trying to be nice or whatever, then he takes the bat out of my friend's hand. Luckily, I had brought my bat too, so I could hold it the whole time. Before I continue, my parents were at the complete other side of the beach, so they could not see any of this. The man then hits my friend's ass with the bat. Clearly uncomfortable, my friend says he's going to go for a walk. He didn't go to our parents because he wanted to see what was going to happen next. The man still holding the bat says, that there is another good spot to hit home runs. The man then repeatedly says, I just want to hit a home run over and over, and then says, Oh, I thought we were at the other beach. How about I drive you guys there so we can play? We all say no thanks and that we want to swim. He then grabs the collar of my friend's shirt and says, You're coming with me. We were all shocked as he started dragging my friend away. That was when I realized what I had to do. I went up to the guy and said, I'll go with you. Really? He responded with a grin. That still makes me terrified to this day. And I say, yeah, 
then hit him with my bat as hard as I could. He goes down instantly, and my friends start crying. We run back to our parents and try to call 911, and by the time they got there he was gone. We left right away, and now whenever I go back there, my friend always jokes about how I saved his life. I would rather not meet that guy again. This story takes place about a week ago. Myself and a friend had decided to go to the beach, as we both couldn't sleep. So we arrived at the beach, which will remain unnamed, but for reference, is on the western coast of New Zealand. Our story begins when we were driving out to the beach. The road is a long and windy road. This time, I have driven this road hundreds of times before both with and without someone in the vehicle with me. I start to get a weird feeling in the pit of my stomach as we drive past a usually closed car park on the right side which is open. It has never been open in the 15 or so years I have been coming to this place. Now, the time was around 11.30 p.m. We both commented on it but shrugged it off at the thought of the amazing photos we would be able to take with the last night of the full moon. As we arrived at the beach, we parked our car in the unlit park, further down the beach than the river. I leapt to the sea. Having grown up around this particular beach, I am very confident when it comes to where I am. So we lock the car and head down the sandy path to the black and white stained surface of the beach. The moonlight casting a creepy glow over everything while providing light for us to walk. We start to head east down the beach, towards a large cave, situated right at the end. This cave is hidden by a huge sand dune, that is, I imagine accumulated sand from the years of the wind whipping it up. This was our destination at the top of the dune. It gives one very unique view of the water. As we head towards the dune, we hear and smell the crackling burning of the woods nearby. In this country, it is strictly against the law to have fires on or anywhere near this beach. We notice a small fire sitting off to the right, about 150 meters from where we were. I noticed from the corner of my eye that there didn't appear to be anyone around this fire. Just a fire burning randomly in the tall, flammable grass next to the dunes. My friend, who we will call Casey, pointed out the fire to me, and we both shrugged it off as some teenagers maybe having some drinks. Even though there was no sound except the cracking of the fire and the slight wind on the beach. About 100 meters down the beach, we encounter the first of the night's, shall we say, issues? I see a man sitting in the middle of the sand, just staring at the water. I didn't initially think this was weird, but upon further inspection, the guy was just staring out of the water, apparently not aware of the two people calling out to him. Strange, but hey, <laughs> some people are strange. So we get to the dune and climb up the 20 or so meters of sand to the top. And just for reference, the black cave mouth was to our backs as we snapped picture after picture of the beach and the water, all under the moonlit, clear, starry sky. And suddenly from behind us comes a strange, growling sound, like a dog, but it was fuzzy, like it was a human pretending to be a dog. And I'll be honest, by this time I was ready to get the fuck out of there. And I looked at Casey and said, I have enough nope in my life. I'm going back to the car. As we were descending down the sand dune, the sound got louder and louder like it was following us, and every step we took made it move closer. I'll admit, I'm not the fittest of people, and neither is the friend, but the adrenaline kicked in, and that moment I grabbed her hand, and we booked it down the beach. We only got about 500 meters before this weird staring guy came back into view. This time, he was not staring at the water, he was staring at us. My mother always told me if something doesn't feel right, and more than likely is not right. 
I don't know what it was about this man's eyes, but they looked menacing. As we ran towards him, though, he started fucking barking at us. As we passed, he got up on all fours like a dog with his arse in the air and chased us. I've never, ever been so scared in my life. As I ran towards what I thought was the path, we came down. I grabbed my friend's hand and guided her up the path. The growling and barking man had not followed us up this path, and I don't know why. If it was he didn't see us go up, or if it was just done fucking with us. Spoiler, this path led us deeper into the brush beside the beach. We walked, using a single phone flashlight to guide our way. My foot grazed something, not sand or grass, but more solid. As I shone the light down, I saw it. It was a chewed-up shoe that looked like it was abandoned in a hurry. As we fumbled through the brush and tall grass, I could see the road. It was so close, but so far. As I moved towards it, we heard someone yell, What the fuck? And shone a flashlight at us. It was someone camping in the tall grass. I have never been so happy to see another human being in my life, I said. We were coming back from the beach and got lost. What's up with the guy who is barking on the beach? The guy told us he hadn't heard anything and to fuck off before I smash you. We made it back to the road and realized we were still about one kilometer from the car. By road, but only about 200 meters from the beach. At this time, the internal argument of my lazy self started. We sluggishly walked the roadway, not wanting to go anywhere near the beach. When I got back to my car, I noticed that a part of my trim had been lifted and looked like someone has chewed it. I will never go wandering on that beach at night ever again. So creepy guy, sitting on the beach, barking at people in the middle of the night. Let's not meet. This happened to my father. He joined the Navy somewhere around 80 to 84. He's told me many stories over the years, but one that sticks out in my mind was his first time at sea on a submarine. He'd recently got promoted and opted to become a submariner because of the exclusivity of the position. Less crew and usually only room for one to two people of your specific trade. Basically, you have to be the best to get on a sub. Anyway, his first night out at sea on a submarine, and everyone is asleep in their bunks. If you haven't seen them, they usually stack two to three high, and line the sides of the hull in a long hallway type formation. Dad got stuck in one of the bunks at the very back. He wakes up around 2am to alarms and lights going off everyone rushing out of their bunks and out to the hatch into the next section of the submarine. Dad being the last to wake up and the last out the bunks, ended up to the latch too late. It closed, sealed, and locked in front of him, with someone shouting on the other side, Mike, find the leak. Apparently, a leak had sprung somewhere around the bunks. It either had to be fixed or that section of the submarine would have to be sealed to prevent the water from spreading, leading him to drowning. Eventually he found it, sealed it, and the hatch was opened. He has a ton of stories, but this one is the one that scared him the most. This story also made me think of the Simpsons episode, where this happened to Homer, except he sealed it with an earring. While underway in Lake Huron, at about 0200, our small boat crew decided to go investigate this old offshore gypsum loading dock. It's about three stories tall, and had been abandoned for many years. Real creepy looking place. Anyway, we are just putzing around this thing, when we see what looks like a spotlight shine directly onto the outside wall of the dock. The spotlight was a perfect circle, about five feet in diameter bright white, and only shined for a few seconds, but it was enough time for it to make a large figure eight. Now this gypsum dock was about a half a mile out into the lake, so we are thinking there is no way someone from shore could have done this. We tried everything to recreate the spotlight effect. We drove around who knows how many times to see if it was something reflecting off the boat. 
We use our flashlights, our signal mirrors using moonlight, even our own small boat spotlight. But nothing matched how perfectly round and bright the original light was. We chalked it up to aliens and got the fuck out. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I do hope that you enjoyed tonight's stories. Certainly, a great topic. I'd like to extend a huge thank you to my good friend Killer Orange Cat for joining me in tonight's video. It was an honour having you, sir. Now, for all of you still listening, it would mean the world to me if you would carry on to listen to part two of this collaboration over on Killer Orange Cat's channel. I've narrated two exclusive stories over there, which are really, really good. I dare say better than all of these. So what are you waiting for? The link can be found on screen now and in the description and probably even the pinned comment if you are so inclined. And I'll see you all over there.